Lesson 10 Satan's Final Deceptions Sabbath Afternoon May 27 Just before us is the closing struggle of the great controversy when, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, Satan is to work to misrepresent the character of God that he may seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. If there was ever a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that, in this time of peril, God has called to be the depositaries of his holy law and to vindicate his character before the world. Those to whom has been committed a trust so sacred must be spiritualized, elevated, vitalized by the truths they profess to believe. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, Page 746. Jesus says, Thy word is truth. We need then to become familiar with the word of God, to study and to practice it in life. We deny Jesus Christ as the one who taketh away the sins of the world if we do not, after accepting the truth, reveal to the world the sanctifying effects of the truth on our own characters. If we are not better men and women, if we are not more kind-hearted, more pitiful, more courteous, more full of tenderness and love, if we do not manifest to others the love that led Jesus to the world on his mission of mercy, we are not witnesses to the world of the power of Jesus Christ. Christ is our model, but unless we behold him, unless we contemplate his character, we shall not reflect his character in our practical life. He was meek and lowly in heart. He never did a rude action, never spoke a discourteous word. The Lord is not pleased with our blunt, hard, unsympathetic ways toward others. All this selfishness must be purged away from our characters, and we must wear the yoke of Christ. Then we shall be fitting up for the society of heavenly angels. As the Lord of life and glory came to our world to represent the Father, so we are to go to the world to represent Jesus. That I may know him, page 306. Run the Christian race with patience and rise superior to every temptation, however grievous it may be, that shall come to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and if you are desirous of taking the first upward step, you will find his hand stretched out to help you. It remains with you individually as to whether you walk in the light of the Son of Righteousness or in the darkness of error. The truth of God can be a blessing to you only as you permit its influence to purify and refine your soul. Sons and Daughters of God, page 79. Sunday, May 28. The way that seems right in a man's eyes. Once let impulse and emotion get the mastery over calm judgment, and there may be altogether too much speed, even in traveling a right road. He who travels too fast will find it perilous in more ways than one. It may not be long before he will branch off from the right road into a wrong path. Not once should feeling be allowed to get the mastery over judgment. There is danger of excess in that which is lawful, and that which is not lawful will surely lead into false paths. If there is not careful, earnest, sensible work, solid as a rock in the advancement of every idea and principle, and in every representation given, souls will be ruined. Many suppose an emotion or a rapture of feeling to be an evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit. There is danger that right sentiments will not be understood and that Christ's words, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, will lose their significance. Tell our people, be not anxious to bring in something not revealed in the word. Keep close to Christ. Selected Messages, Book 2, pages 17 and 18. Jesus has raised his voice in warning. 
Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 and 16. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 16. If any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not, for false Christs and false prophets shall arise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Mark chapter 13 verses 21 to 23. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 341. God has given men no liberty to depart from his requirements. The Lord had declared to Israel, Ye shall not do every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes, but ye shall observe and hear all these words which I command thee. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 8 and 28. In deciding upon any course of action, we are not to ask whether we can see that harm will result from it, but whether it is in keeping with the will of God. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 No stronger evidence can be given of Satan's delusive power than that many who are thus led by him deceive themselves with the belief that they are in the service of God. When Korah, Dathan, and Abiram rebelled against the authority of Moses, they thought they were opposing only a human leader, a man like themselves, and they came to believe that they were verily doing God's service. The same spirit still exists in the hearts of those who set themselves to follow their own will in opposition to the will of God. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 634 and 635. Monday, May 29. The Old Life of Immortality Satan told his angels to make a special effort to spread the lie first repeated to Eve in Eden, Ye shall not surely die. And as the error was received by the people and they were led to believe that man was immortal, Satan led them on to believe that the sinner would live in eternal misery. Then the way was prepared for Satan to work through his representatives and hold up God before the people as a revengeful tyrant, one who plunges all those into hell who do not please him and causes them ever to feel his wrath, and while they suffer unutterable anguish and writhe in the eternal flames, he is represented as looking down upon them with satisfaction. Satan knew that if this error should be received, God would be hated by many instead of being loved and adored, and that many would be led to believe that the threatenings of God's word would not be literally fulfilled, for it would be against his character of benevolence and love to plunge into eternal torments the beings whom he had created. Early Writings, page 218 much of the sad result of spiritualism will rest upon ministers of this age, for they have trampled the truth under their feet and in its stead have preferred fables. The immortality of the soul is the foundation of spiritualism. The Word of God nowhere teaches that the soul of man is immortal. Immortality is an attribute of God only. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 16 who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. God's word, rightly understood and applied, is a safeguard against spiritualism. This widespread dogma has turned thousands to universalism, infidelity, and atheism. The word of God is plain. It is a straight chain of truth and will prove an anchor to those who are willing to receive it, even if they have to sacrifice their cherished fables. 
it will save them from the terrible delusions of these perilous times. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 344. The doctrine of natural immortality has prepared the way for modern spiritualism. Here is a channel regarded as sacred through which Satan works for the accomplishment of his purposes. The fallen angels who do his bidding appear as messengers from the spirit world. While professing to bring the living into communication with the dead, Satan exercises his bewitching influence upon their minds. Many endeavor to account for spiritual manifestations by attributing them wholly to fraud and sleight of hand on the part of the medium. While it is true that the results of trickery have often been palmed off as genuine manifestations, there have been also marked exhibitions of supernatural power. The mysterious wrapping with which modern spiritualism began was not the result of human trickery or cunning, but the direct work of evil angels who thus introduced one of the most successful of soul-destroying delusions. Many will be ensnared through the belief that spiritualism is a merely human imposture. When brought face to face with manifestations which they can but regard as supernatural, they will be deceived and will be led to accept them as the great power of God. The Story of Redemption, pages 393 and 394. Tuesday, May 30. Babylon, the center of sun worship. In the sixth year of the reign of Zedekiah, the Lord revealed to Ezekiel in vision some of the abominations that were being practiced in Jerusalem and within the gate of the Lord's house and even in the inner court. Those who should have been spiritual leaders among the people, the ancients of the house of Israel, to the number of seventy, were seen offering incense before the idolatrous representations that had been introduced into hidden chambers within the sacred precincts of the temple court. There were still greater abominations for the prophet to behold. At a gate leading from the outer to the inner court, he was shown women weeping for Tammuz, and within the inner court of the Lord's house, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 13 to 16. Prophets and Kings, pages 448 and 449. Constantine, while still a heathen, issued a decree enjoining the general observance of Sunday as a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. After his conversion, he remained a staunch advocate of Sunday, and his pagan edict was then enforced by him in the interests of his new faith. But the honor shown this day was not as yet sufficient to prevent Christians from regarding the true Sabbath as the holy of the Lord. Another step must be taken. The false Sabbath must be exalted to an equality with the true. A few years after the issue of Constantine's decree, the Bishop of Rome conferred on the Sunday the title of Lord's Day. Thus the people were gradually led to regard it as possessing a degree of sacredness. Still the original Sabbath was kept. The Story of Redemption, page 329. The arch-deceiver was resolved to gather the Christian world under his banner and to exercise his power through his vicegerent, the proud pontiff who claimed to be the representative of Christ. Through half-converted pagans, ambitious prelates, and world-loving churchmen, he accomplished his purpose. Vast councils were held from time to time in which the dignitaries of the church were convened from all the world. In nearly every council, the Sabbath which God had instituted was pressed down a little lower while the Sunday was correspondingly exalted. Thus the pagan festival came finally to be honored as a divine institution, while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism and its observers were declared to be accursed. Protestants now urged that the resurrection of Christ on Sunday made it the Christian Sabbath, but scripture evidence is lacking. No such honor was given to the day by Christ or his apostles. 
the observance of Sunday as a Christian institution has its origin in that mystery of lawlessness which, even in Paul's day, had begun its work. The Story of Redemption, pages 229 and 230. Wednesday, May 31, A Call to Faithfulness The present is a season of solemn privilege and sacred trust. If the servants of God keep faithfully the trust given to them, great will be their reward. The earnest toil, the unselfish work, the patient, persevering effort will be abundantly rewarded. Jesus will say, Henceforth I call you not servants, but friends. See John chapter 15, verse 15. The approval of the master is not given because of the greatness of the work performed, but because of fidelity in all that has been done. It is not the results we attain, but the motives from which we act that weigh with God. He prizes goodness and faithfulness above all else. Gospel Workers, page 267. The faithful ambassador of Christ is not ashamed of the banner of truth. He does not cease from proclaiming the truth, however unpopular it may be. In all places, in season, out of season, he heralds the glad tidings of salvation. Missionaries for God are called to face dangers, endure privations, and suffer reproach for the truth's sake, yet amid dangers, hardships, and reproach, they are still to hold the banner aloft. The third angel proclaims his message in no whispered tones, in no hesitant manner. He cries with a loud voice while flying swiftly through the midst of heaven. This shows that the work of God's servants is to be earnest and rapidly performed. They must be brave witnesses for the truth, with no shame upon their countenances, with uplifted heads, with the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness shining upon them, with rejoicing that their redemption draweth nigh, they go forth declaring the last message of mercy to the world. Reflecting Christ, page 347. Every man in God's world is under the laws of his government. God has placed the Sabbath in the bosom of the Decalogue and has made it the criterion of obedience. Through it, we may learn of his power as displayed in his works and his word. Sanctification is claimed by professed Christians who ignore God's holy rest day for a spurious Sabbath, but God declares that the sanctification coming from Him is bestowed on those only who honor Him by obeying His commands. The sanctification claimed by those who continue in transgression is a spurious sanctification. Thus the religious world is deceived by the enemy of God and man. Men have sought out many inventions. They have taken a common day upon which God has placed no sanctity and have clothed it with sacred prerogatives. They have declared it to be a holy day, but this does not give it a vestige of sanctity. They dishonor God by accepting human institutions and presenting to the world as the Christian Sabbath a day which has no thus saith the Lord for its authority. Maranatha, page 238. Thursday, June 1. Grace for Obedience When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Almost the last act of his ministry was to cleanse the temple again. So in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message and the voice heard in heaven, Come out of her, my people, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Revelation chapter 18, verses 4 and 5. As God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, that they might keep his Sabbath, so he calls his people out of Babylon, that they may not worship the beast nor his image. The man of sin, who thought to change times and laws, has exalted himself above God by presenting the spurious Sabbath to the world. The Christian world has accepted this child of the papacy and cradled and nourished it, thus defying God by removing his memorial and setting up a rival Sabbath. Selected Messages, Book 3, pages 405 and 406.
In the home, those who have received Christ are to show what grace has done for them. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. A conscious authority pervades the true believer in Christ that makes its influence felt throughout the home. This is favorable for the perfection of the characters of all in the home. A well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot gainsay. All can see that there is an influence at work in the family that affects the children and that the God of Abraham is with them. If the homes of professed Christians had a right religious mold, they would exert a mighty influence for good. They would indeed be the light of the world. The Adventist Home, page 36. He who becomes a partaker of the divine nature will be in harmony with God's great standard of righteousness, His holy law. This is the rule by which God measures the actions of men. This will be the test of character in the judgment. Satan had claimed that it was impossible for man to obey God's commandments, and in our own strength, it is true that we cannot obey them. But Christ came in the form of humanity, and by his perfect obedience, he proved that humanity and divinity combined can obey every one of God's precepts. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John chapter 1 verse 12. This power is not in the human agent. It is the power of God. When a soul receives Christ, he receives power to live the life of Christ. Christ's Object Lessons, page 314. For further reading, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, The Controversy Waxes Stronger, page 407, and Selected Messages, The Bereaved, book 2, page 270.